Hello and welcome to another episode of Podcast DX, the show that brings you interviews with people just like you, whose lives were forever changed by a medical diagnosis. I'm Lita. And Ron isn't with us this week. And I'm Jean Marie. <laughs> yeah, there goes that script. Yep. Collectively, we're the hosts of Podcast DX. On today's show, we are speaking with Dr. Joan, and I should have asked before the show, mm-hmm. is it Ifland or Ifland? It's Ifland. That's like it's but like it's spelled if land. Okay. Uh Dr. Ifland is a bit of a Renaissance woman. In 2010, she received her PhD from the Union Institute and University in Cincinnati, Ohio, with an emphasis in food addiction, no, excuse me, addiction nutrition. She also earned an MBA. Oh yeah, she's, she's not sitting down. Nope. (laughs) From <laughs> from Stanford and a Bachelor of Arts degree in economics and political science. Ethics in research were in 20, uh, excuse me. So in addition, she's oh, also. Thank you. Go right ahead. She's also been studying ethics and research. Okay. Neuroscience. Thank you. Drugs and society. Uh-huh. Italian language studies. Ciao. Yeah, and she's joining us today to talk about processed food addictions. And welcome to the show, Joan. Thanks for saving me, Jean. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Good save. And um, Joan, this is Jean Marie. If I'm ever on the game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Do you mind if I call you as my call a friend for help? Because <laughs> you probably you have, have a, a wealth your, of information. Exactly. Your, your breadth of knowledge is extensive. And we really well, and when we it. get into the interview, you'll see why. Okay. Um, okay. And this is all obviously orchestrated from somewhere above. But when we get into the interview, you'll see why that business background is so important and why the political background is so important. Okay. All right. Uh, it Good. all fits together. And it's not, it really can't understand what's going on unless you know what the, all the different parts are doing. Sure. 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 I can understand and, that. Yeah, and food is is a business. So I can, yeah, I can definitely yeah. see how that comes mm-hmm. into play. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, Joan, what inspired you to begin with uh, to pursue a career in processed food addiction? Well, um, I say it started when I was born. I was born to two addicted people. Okay. And our family's particular reaction to processed foods is a rage. Oh. And oh. uh, out of control behavior, okay. like, a, like like an alcoholic's response. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I grew up in a very rageful household. Then, um, when I had my two children in '83 and '84, I was just desperate that that there not be raging in our household. But there I was raging. So I did personal therapy. I I learned everything about my childhood issues, and I was still raging. I was also yo-yo dieting, uh, and I did a women's group, a women's healing group. I trained with them and became a leader in that organization, still raging. I went to a codepend- a codependency group, still raging. But somebody in the codependency group heard it. She heard the kind of behavior that's driven by sugar. Okay. So I, you know, yo-yo dieting couldn't do the restricted calories anymore. And I joined a food addiction recovery group. And within three weeks, all I did was eliminate sugars and flours. But within three weeks, the raging had stopped. Wow. Yeah. Uh, So I was hooked on a new career. I had, you know, I had my nice, lovely, prestigious Stanford MBA. I had worked for five years in a Fortune 200 corporation on their finance staff. And then uh, when I had my two kids, I quit. And then I was too sick to go back. The allergies and the fatigue and the brain fog and the constant sinus infection, I couldn't go back to work. And it all cleared up. It all cleared up when I got off the sugars and flowers. That's an amazing. So that was my new career. That's mm-hmm. like a, a big aha moment. Mm-hmm. It was like winning the lottery every day. The cravings were gone. The brain fog was gone. The fatigue was gone. The irritability was gone. The uh, sinus infection was gone. The allergies were gone. The bloating was gone. Hmm. And uh, uh, these were things that I had been told I, 
I'd have for the rest of my life. Hmm. And then they were just gone. Okay. So I, I mean, I got, I just wanted to tell everybody, I didn't sure. really understand addiction at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I said to my family, I'm not going to give you these foods anymore. Uh, here are the foods I will give you. And they circled everything. And I gave them those foods and they got better. The kids lost weight. Their grades came way up. They were able to focus on their work. They, uh, they became popular at school because they had this nice, even disposition. You know, they ran for class offices and amazing. Uh, became heads of their sports teams. <laughs> wow. They got into you know top ten universities in very competitive years. But I thought to myself at the time, I thought this isn't fair. I'm going to tell the other moms sure. to eliminate these sugars and flowers from their kids' diets, and. Uh, because I just thought, wow, you know, my kids are the only clear-headed kids in this school. Nobody you, could do it. You know what it reminds so, me of? Uh, do you remember the movie that uh, Robin Williams was in? Uh, where they were in a um, uh, uh, institution for people that were mentally. Oh, yes, yes. And, yes, and they gave him some. Oliver Stone. Right? And they gave him some type of a, a new medication, and it woke everybody up, and it was like overnight, like from gone to awaken and that's what it sounds like your story is i think that was the name of the movie awaken oh well there you oliver. go <laughs> there you go it was based on an oliver stone book okay okay yeah yes. and, and that's know, and that's um, what triggered that, in my mind it, it sounds like such a powerful is, powerful message oh man yeah you know, i could and, see that and it never quits uh, I mean, I, there have been moments when I was so terrified I would lose it. And I did lose it at one point. It's an addiction. Okay, okay. So, um, All right, well, we'll that's continue. That's a very apt that, analogy. That's a great yeah. start for this story. Well, let's take a step back. Okay. And, um, Joan, what exactly is a processed food? So there are seven gr uh, primary categories and that's one of the reasons why this addiction is so hard to beat. If you're just addicted to alcohol, for example, only your dopamine pathway is, is hyper, hyperactivated. But these seven, they're really chemicals. They're not really food. Uh, they activate all four of the major addiction pathways. So you're really addicted. I right. mean, the cravings okay. are really intense and right. we're helpless to fight them. So it's any kind of a sweetener. Uh, when a sweetener or a salt touches a taste bud, it's a half second until the brain reacts. Uh, processed fats, when fats touch the roof of the mouth, it's a half a second until the brain is impacted, as opposed to like nicotine or other drugs where it takes 10 seconds or 10 minutes. Uh, so that, that's a huge impact on the brain. Mm -hmm. Uh, so flour, uh, processed carbohydrates, carbohydrates that have been turned into a powder. They uh, also, they get into the bloodstream very quickly. They ignite a serotonin response. Gluten, gluten, excessive salt, and dairy have all been shown to activate the same pathway in the brain as opium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are the opiate pathways and they're named after uh, the fact that opium activate, uh, activates them. And then there's uh, the fats also activate the cannabis, the same pathway as cannabis. So the brain is, is being conditioned uh, in the same way that it is by recreational drugs. Mm -hmm. And then you have food additives. Mm -hmm. And the, the same people who manufactured cigarettes are now manufacturing processed foods. And we know that they extracted and concentrated nicotine put it back into the cigarettes to make them addictive. And we have some other, just one other study showing that they added substances to cigarettes to make them addictive. So this is just a basic rule in the addiction business playbook. Add stuff, hide stuff in the product until people are addicted. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's something you're not going to see in a commercial. No. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Oh, no, 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 no. And you see, it's kind of interesting, but you see the top three fast food 
you know, genres are are combinations of all seven of those, mm -hmm. which are the Mexican, the Tex the taco style, the pizza style, and the burger style. Mm -hmm. And then a distant fourth is our Asian or Oriental style dishes, and they don't have cheese typically, so I think that's why they're not quite so popular. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. So the dairy really kind of puts it over the edge, maybe. Yes, there are four different natural casomorphines in dairy. So dairy is a substance that's, that's very specifically created to put a baby cow to sleep. So it's a pretty heavy narcotic. Makes sense. Uh, so that that baby cow will absorb nutrients. Mm -hmm. uh, human breast milk also has morphine in it. It's designed to put that baby to sleep so the baby will absorb the nutrients. Uh, however... Not surprisingly, dairy turns on a weight gain gene. Like, duh, yeah, you want 500 pounds to go on that baby calf in one oh, year. Okay, so okay. it's it's a really not a great product for humans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And actually, we recently talked about um, food reactions in yeah. another episode and how um, I think it was like 80% of individuals don't have the um the enzymes at the level to, to digest, right, to digest dairy. Um, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It turns on a prostate cancer gene. It turns on an acne gene. It turns on a diabetes gene. <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. People have a really hard time giving it up because it's also got a little bit of salt in it mm -hmm. and lactose, which is a sweet mm -hmm. taste, okay. and fat. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a perfect got, storm of addiction. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. Never thought about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I yeah. didn't I did not see that one coming, to be honest. The other ones <laughs> the other ones on the list I kind of I could kind of understand, but I did not see well two. I did not see salt or dairy. Um it's excessive excessive salt okay. has been shown to activate that uh, opiate pathway. Okay. Um you, you need salt. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. The the sure. salt free stuff also has its own problems because you don't have enough electrolytes. Right. So people who are no salt diets are in just as much trouble as people with excessive salt. Okay. They There's got to be a balance. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, and, and Joan, if someone's thinking, boy, you know, that sounds like everything that I'm craving on a daily basis. Um, in, and I know that's what my mom is thinking right now. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, mm -hmm. how can you... How do you know for sure that you have a processed food addiction? What are some indicators? Okay, good. We do have a self quiz on oh. our uh, website. Good. So I don't know. You think I can just cut this? If, if this is no, please. Yes, this, no, feel free. And see, this is this part is of your what episode. we're going. This mm -hmm. is what we're going to be doing with the video. Right. We Excellent. would have a yes, but we will have a link if you want to tell us about that, and we'll have a link on our website. That, yes, and uh, include that as well. All right. So. Um, I did my doctoral dissertation on this very issue. Could you adopt the, the diagnostic criteria for uh, alcoholism to eating? Okay. And would it be valid? Would it create a valid questionnaire? Mm -hmm. So the American Psychiatric Association has been working on diagnoses for addictions for 50 years. And they now have 11 manifestations. Uh, 11 signs, if you will. Mm -hmm. So we're, what we're offering is not a diagnosis, right. but you can, you can just determine whether you're experiencing the signs. And I'll go through them. There mm -hmm. are 11 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is unintended use. So you wake up and you say, today I'm going to eat clean. By 10 o'clock, you're eating something you didn't plan to. You're going to drive straight home without stopping for fast food, and you're stopping for fast food. You're going to take two out of the box, and somehow the box disappears. Mm -hmm. Those are all examples of unintended use. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody has these. Mm -hmm. As you listen to these, keep, bear in mind, six or more is a severe addiction. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay, so most people have number one, unintended mm -hmm. use. Number two, failure to cut back. And uh, everybody's got that. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to cut back, they lose the weight, and then they regain it. Number three is time spent. Uh, increasingly, you notice that you're thinking about food all the time. You're stopping for it. You're planning it. You're eating it. You're sleeping it off. Uh, you're getting up in the middle of the night to get it. 
uh, you only go to events where you know the food's going to be good. So uh, increasing amounts of time spent. Number four is cravings. Everybody has cravings, mm -hmm. and the food industry flaunts this. You know, the the bet you can't eat just one is unintended use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I just uh, looked at a product in a store the other day, and on the back of it, it said, highly addictive. Oh. So, <laughs> As a marketing yeah. that knows yeah. that the addiction accusations are coming mm -hmm. and they're valid. Mm -hmm. So what they're trying to do is neutralize the, uh, they're, they're trying to make it acceptable mm -hmm. to have an addiction. Yeah. So that's number four is cravings. Number five is um, failure to fulfill roles. So you're too big to get down on the floor with your kids and you're still eating or your brain fog and your fatigue are so intense that you're not going to apply for that promotion and you're still eating. Or you have, um, uh, you know, we have people dropping out of school all the time because they can't do the work. So mm -hmm. failure to fulfill roles. Okay. Number six is um, relationship problems. Somebody wants me to stop eating, I can't. Uh, uh, I'm fighting with my relationship person so often that, and I'm eating over it. I don't want to connect with this person because I'd rather go in the laundry room and eat what I stashed there. Uh, it's hard to connect because I'm so tired. I'm so depressed. I'm so fatigued and I'm still eating. The next one is uh, activities given up. I don't want to go because those people are going to see that I gained weight. Uh, I don't want to go because I'd rather go home and eat. Activities given up and then hazardous use. So normally hazardous use is about driving drunk. Well, we are driving, you know, with our elbows while we're shoveling in the, mm -hmm. the fast food or we're so big, we can't see the curb anymore. We tend to fall and we're still eating. The next one is a use in spite of knowledge of consequences, which everybody has. Everybody started to eat something with, well, I know I shouldn't, but. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's what's, uh, there's tolerance, uh, increasing amounts. So you used to eat something in the evening. Now you're eating it at lunch and at evening. Now you're eating it at breakfast and at evening. You used to stop for fast food once a week. Now you're stopping once a day or three times a day. You used to buy this size, and now you're buying a bigger size. Mm -hmm. Or you used to buy it, um, you know, it used to be in the kitchen, and now it's in the kitchen and the bedroom and the den. That's how you kind of gauge that you're eating more of something. Sure. And then the last one is uh, withdrawal. And you can, ha or you can gauge that because you're eating for a reason other than hunger. Okay. Okay. You're, eating, you're eating because you have a headache or because mm -hmm. you have a stomach ache or because you're angry or because you're depressed or because you're tired. Uh, that is withdrawal avoidance. Okay. You're heading into withdrawal. When you, when, as soon as you mentioned that, I was wondering why isn't caffeine one of the categories? Is that It should be. I, f I forgot to mention that. Very okay. good. Okay. Very good. Because I know I'm, so in, I'm addicted to caffeine, so I know. Oh, gosh, it's a nasty drug. Yeah. It's a nasty yeah. drug. When I see it being given to children, I just want when, to when you said When you said something like, um, you know, you're going to do it, you're going you're gonna to eat this, or you're going to process this because you have a headache. If I don't have a Diet Coke uh, or something with caffeine, uh, a tea or something, I will get a headache. But it's, uh -huh. and I and I am quite aware of the fact that it's the... The fact that I'm addicted to the caffeine that's causing the headache. I'm aware mm -hmm. of that. But mm -hmm. do I have the strength to stop until the headaches dissipate? Mm -hmm. No, because I'm a weak No, well, well, I think we'll get no, there. No, 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 you're not yeah, weak. We'll you are okay. not weak. Okay. I just want to really, if we can just stop here. The, because an addiction is an addiction, people have developed all this mythology around why they do things. Mm -hmm. We do things because we have these hyperactivated reward system brain cells. Okay. That's it. Right. And there's treatment for it. Okay. There's recovery for it. Okay. So all of this mythology, childhood issues, self-sabotage, 
not trying hard enough, don't like myself, not enough willpower. Those are all just nonsense. You know, you've got some hyperactivated uh, reward center of brain cells. That's all. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So give yourself a break. All right. Yeah. So stop that self blame because <laughs> the diet industry obviously has completely failed to recognize this. And therefore, 99.9% .9 of people regain weight after losing right. it. And then the diet industry or the health industry blames the individual. Uh, you don't want this bad enough. Right. You're right. spiritually bankrupt. Right. Well, and no. It, right. It's it, not it an does. addiction. And you, practitioner, you haven't been trained in this. So you're frustrated and I'm frustrated. And we're both traumatized by not being able to fix this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it does seem that a number of um, commercially available diets are just it, they're just processed foods. They're just another yes, form of yes, processed foods. Yes, yes, So all these big manufacturers, manufacturers have bought reduced calorie processed foods. Mm -hmm. And they are, they're just as addictive and devastating, destructive. Mm -hmm. We have 141 diseases associated with processed foods. This is 10 times worse than cigarettes. And yet, um, you know, the processed food manufacturers just grab on to every opportunity, processed gluten-free, processed low calorie, mm -hmm. processed fat-free. It's all destructive, it's all addictive, and it's all incredibly deceptive. Okay. Um, I guess I'm gonna ask a like a deep question here, uh, something that only a doctor would be able to answer. What makes processed foods so addictive? And also, what are some of the most addictive? Wait, is that what the question mm -hmm. was? Yeah, okay. addictive uh -huh. foods. foods. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. It's the concentrating. Okay. So plants have natural endorphins in them. It's not like you... You, you eat just to survive. You eat because it's pleasurable. Mm -hmm. There is this little, you know, pleasurable release in those reward systems in the brain. And as long as you're eating all the fiber and you're crunching and chewing a lot and it's getting into your system slowly, no problem. Okay. Like if you've ever tried to chew a, uh, like an oat kernel, you have to chew for a really long time. Okay. Mm -hmm. If you take the fiber out, which speeds up absorption, and then you grind it into a powder, mm -hmm. which means it's going to get into your system all at once, that's enough to create a concentrated release of those pleasurable neurotransmitters. Okay. And then you, you're, you're literally getting a high, mm -hmm. which that brain cell cannot sustain. So it's followed by a crash. Mm -hmm. That's very unpleasant okay. to not have enough pleasurable neurotransmitters in your brain. And then you crave it. Your brain just like, oh my gosh, can we get that dopamine back up, please? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there you are, you're addicted. Wow. Now, once you're addicted, so there are things called associated cues. So you don't have to actually eat the oat flour you can just see an advertisement for oat flour, or you can see something made from oat flour, and that you'll get that high and crash, and you'll be seeking it compulsively. Okay, so it's a Pavlovian effect. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. It's a Pavlovian response. Right. It's Pavlovian okay. conditioning mm -hmm. of the reward centers in okay. the brain. Hmm. Okay. And they do that with marketing too, uh, with the way so, they package it. Uh, and you market know, this it. is where my business background came in. I okay. just uh, last year published a paper on this. It's the addiction business model. Hmm. It's a business model. They use it for cigarettes. They use it for alcohol. They use it for cannabis. The pharmaceutical companies used it to market opiates to doctors. They use it for vaping. It's a business model. It is the addiction business model. The tobacco companies developed it. They just they honed it. Two thirds of Americans were addicted at the height of smoking, and now you know over two thirds of Americans, including children, are overweight or obese. And, and it's a specific business model. I call it the five A's. Lots and lots of advertising. 
lots and lots of availability. You know, like they took out the cigarette vending machines and they put in the, so the snack mm -hmm. machine. Mm -hmm. Available everywhere within reach of everybody all the time. Affordable. So the tobacco industry didn't come into processed foods until high fructose corn syrup was on the market. Before that, the main ingredient, sugar, was controlled by a cartel. But once they got that cheap sweetener, boom, the cheap sweetener came on the market in the 19, in about 1980, and tobacco came and took over Kraft, Nabisco, and General Foods in 85 to 87. So it's got to be a cheap substance because you've got to be able to use it often mm -hmm. enough to get addicted to it. Young age of onset. So just like the tobacco industry went after 10 year old boys with the Joe Camel cartoons, mm -hmm. uh, with processed foods, they could go after newborns, put, you know, load up the baby formula, feed it to the mother. So it came through breast milk, 70% sugary breakfast cereals. And just, they just merciless, mercilessly went after toddlers. They increased the number of Saturday morning cartoon commercials for processed foods from about 165 to about 565. 565 commercials in one Saturday morning carried to 65 million households by Nickelodeon. Hmm. It's not really very mysterious mm -hmm. how this all came to be. And then the last A, the fifth A, is to ramp up the addictive ingredients, hide addictive ingredients in the product. They hid nicotine, extra nicotine in the cigarettes. They came in, they hired a consultant named Howie Moskowitz, who had a Harvard PhD in experimental psychology and marketing. And he had developed a method for maximizing the amount of sugar, fat, salt in processed foods. So you could eat a slice of bread in 1970 and eat one slice, but by 1990, that slice could have been so loaded up with sugar, fat, salt, that you would end up eating the loaf. Hmm. As remember, sugar, fat, and salt reach the brain in half a second after touching the mouth. So they're highly addictive. You mm -hmm. could argue that this, well, we do see, we have a lot of evidence that, that sugar is more addictive than cocaine. Mm -hmm. And more destructive, harder on the brain. I hope more you, changes in the brain. I hope you have a bodyguard. I think. I think. I think. <laughs> I think there's. there's I, I think big money behind. I think yeah. after we post this, there's going to be some people looking for you. But there's yeah. also. I know. I know. I yeah. just, when I started out, you know, I was still in my MBA head, and I said, you know, I'm a greater threat to world economies than anybody. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you are. US, Domestic economy is one third food and health. Mm -hmm. And before tobacco came in to processed foods, it was about 15%. Those two industries were about 15% of the domestic economy. And now they are about a third. And they grow in tandem. Right, right. Processed food grows and the health industry grows right along with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. S scary stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, really, it, it is. You know, you know, you have to kind of sit down and and think of this completely intertwined ball that we're dealing with, and how do you untangle it mm -hmm. in order to cure? But we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. All right. Go ahead, Jean. Okay. Um. In well, I guess just in general, is the consumption of processed food. Is it on the rise or are we kind of seeing the error of our ways and are we um, making a marked decrease in the amount we are consuming? No. Oh, um, so I did look at two years. I actually dug down into like the virtual basement of the U.S. Department of Agriculture and got the statistics. Okay. And uh, we would see a 30, first of all, you can see exactly which substances have increased in use in the rise of, during the rise of obesity. Okay. And the big ones are sweeteners, including mm -hmm. high fructose corn syrup, mm -hmm. flours, mostly gluten-containing flours, high-fat dairy, mm -hmm. 
a cheese and sour cream and uh, fried potatoes. Oh, okay. You see exactly. You can see exactly what's. It, it's not beans. Mm-hmm. It's not brown rice. It's mm-hmm. not meat. Mm-hmm. It's these uh, drug-like these drugs that are being presented as if they were food. So we see like a thirty percent. It was a thirty some percent increase between um, the two years I looked at were nineteen seventy and nineteen ninety seven. Okay. So yeah, no, I mean, it just, it, it just keeps rising. Look at the fast food sales. Mm-hmm. It just keeps rising. Right, right. So at that time, in 1997, people were consuming 1.2 pounds per day per person on average. That includes children of those sugars, flours, high fat dairy, and uh, fried potatoes. French fries. Wow. Per uh, day, per person per day. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. I I did not add this to, the, or Jean didn't add this mm-hmm. to the script, mm-hmm. but I have a, a serious question. I believe that processed foods, and I may be totally off base, I believe that processed foods started because our population has exploded so much and people are not living off the farm anymore. They are living in a city. They have to access food remotely and the food has to last longer and, you know, shelf life and all that. But how do we, how, okay, how could we possibly fix it now when there are so many people? Well, is that too deep of a question for this? <laughs> no, 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 no. This is a super excellent question. I think you're right, Lita. I think the the stage was set. All the factors were there for the tobacco industry to come in and exploit those cultural shifts that you're talking about. But those shifts were there in the 1950s, and we didn't have an explosion of obesity. In 1963, the first tobacco company made the purchase of a sugar product. Okay. R.J. Reynolds bought Hawaiian Punch. And this is just so diabolical. It's hard to even hit, listen to it. They repositioned the product. It had been a mixer for adult alcoholic drinks. Oh. They repositioned it as a child's drink. And they targeted children, but they brought over all the tobacco marketing techniques. It's, mm-hmm. it's a diabolical technique. First you addict by hiding addictive substances in the product, and then you surround that person with reminders. Reminders, cues, triggers, messaging, availability. So why did they get two thirds of Americans to smoke? First they addicted them, and, you know, here, free three cigarettes. Mm-hmm. And then uh, they surrounded them with reminders. There were logoed products everywhere you went. There was a Marlboro ad. There was a vending machine. They were cheap. You know, cigarettes started out being five cents a pack. That's another industry that got off the ground because of a reduction in expense. The rolling machine. So once there was a rolling machine and you could sell cigarettes for five cents a pack, it was worth it to advertise and get people addicted. Mm -hmm. So you need, you need all five of those elements. You need that low price. You, you see that happening in tobacco and now happening in, uh, it's, now it's happened in process. Food. Okay, okay. So I'm going to say that it you do have an addiction merchant on the scene to make these things happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were always addictive opiates, but then the pharmaceutical industry came in and deceptively advertised opiates to doctors. Oh, this these aren't addictive. They work really well and they're not addictive. And so doctors just started writing scripts for them. Oh, they're not addictive. Okay, well, I can I can prescribe them. No, you know, they were highly addictive. So the pharmaceutical companies hid the addictive nature of the product. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what do we do now is actually we I've been working, I you guys know I wrote the textbook. Yes. 70% of the textbook for the field. Right. Mm-hmm. Edited the rest of it. And, and I really learned from the textbook, this is a severe addiction. 
I'm sure as I was going through those criteria, most people would say I've got that one and they would get up to that six threshold. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have a severe addiction. Mm -hmm. I love that your program is about diagnoses and new diagnoses. Mm -hmm. This is a new, again, I'm not making a diagnosis and my website's not making a diagnosis, but uh, we've, we validated it in the, uh, my doctoral work. And then there is a full chapter on each one of those diagnoses, diagnostic criteria in the textbook. So I pulled together all the research showing, yes, this does exist in processed food use. Somebody needed so to just, over. they just needed no. to shine, you, you needed to shine that flashlight on the problem. And you did. I needed to show the professionals in the world right. the evidence. Right, mm -hmm. right. They work from evidence. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think the shortest uh, bibliography for one of those chapters is 25 studies, and the longest one is maybe 125. Wow. So people have been studying obesity and eating disorders and drug addiction intensely since brain imaging research became available. Mm -hmm. They saw right away that the brains of obese people were doing the same things as the brains of drug addicted people. So there's tons and tons of evidence. Mostly what the textbook does is it just organizes evidence. Okay. I didn't do any original research mm -hmm. uh, for the textbook, but I was able, I didn't need to. Right. It's what I really did was I took this huge, you know, 2000 puzzle piece, puzzle, <laughs> big saw puzzle piece. I love it. And put them together in a picture. I love it. Boom. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, Joan, are, are artificial sweeteners a solution or a slippery slope? She asks, hey, she asks as she takes a sip of something that's been of sweetened. Artificial. Like artificial. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, and I could tell when you were over there, when she was listing, all, you know, you just kept checking things off and you're like, oh, no. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. Okay. All right. I, I am one. Okay. Yeah, right. it, it will definitely trigger the addictive response. It's mm -hmm. just the taste of sweetness. And it tricks the, the pancreas. Mm -hmm. So the pancreas thinks, wow, a lot of sugar is coming. It starts putting out insulin to grab that glucose and put oh. it into fat cells so that you don't get so high on sugar, you could die. You know, uh -huh. that's a, di a okay. diabetic coma. Okay. So there's the pancreas pumping out all this insulin. The insulin's grabbing all the glucose that's there and putting it into fat cells and muscle cells, except there's no sugar. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you get a huge blood glucose drop and you start craving sugar and you will overeat okay. in response to that. Okay. So it's, it's, okay. So that, yeah, it, it's a bad thing. It's a very, okay, thank you. And, yeah. and then, Joan, I have to ask the question, what can we do when we have a food craving? And when that food craving hits, what options do we have? So there, um, this is a pretty deep skill set. Okay. The, the skill set of retraining the brain not to crave. Mm -hmm. or are stopping a craving when it occurs. Mm -hmm. And one thing that really helped me is there's a huge body of evidence showing that cravings are triggered by cues. Okay. Tr triggers, mm -hmm. reminders, mm -hmm. stimulation, messaging. So what we do is we train people in six broad categories of cueing. And you do one of two things with cues. You either avoid them or you teach your brain a different response. So uh, suppose you have somebody in your household who insists on leaving uh, these foods out on the kitchen counter and you're not ready to throw them away. <laughs> you can train your brain to say, instead of saying, oh, that looks so good, to say, oh, that'll give me cancer. You train your brain and you, it's just like a flashcard. It's just like learning a language. Mm -hmm. this, it's the same mechanism as you use to learn a language, which is you put the, I've made other notes on this card. You can see it says cheesecake on this side. <laughs> and 
on the back, it says uncomfortable, high blood pressure, inability to get down on floor, self-consciousness, shame, depression. Perfect. I love it. So now th- this was somebody who, wh- who's, um, it was a, it was a man, his wife was leaving this food, making big items, uh, dessert items and leaving them out on the kitchen counter. Mm-hmm. So I said, make yourself a flashcard. Dessert, consequences. So what, what are you doing when you do this? This is Pavlovian conditioning of brain cells so that when your brain receives that message, oh, look what's available. It goes over to, oh my gosh, that's going to make me so sick. That is going to hurt so bad. Ah! <laughs> Instead of going over to, oh, that looks good. Mm-hmm. And you can train your brain to do that. It's the same thing. Like if you want to travel in France and you want to learn French, when you go to France and you're being stimulated, I'm in France, I'm hearing French all around me. You want to go to the French trained part of your brain where you have through a flashcard, you put the word car on one side and voiture on the other side. So when you see a car, the, the word that comes to your mind is not car. The word that comes to mind is voiture. It's, it's just Pavlovian conditioning by association. Okay. Okay. So I mean, you can do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, with, we, uh, right. Cravings as right. Well. Okay. All right. You, you mentioned yeah. five, right? So there are six cat, six broad categories okay. of, cra- of cueing. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this is just my own work, but mm-hmm. um, body, either body shape or body pain, the food itself, all the hidden and, uh, I call them drugs, addictive drugs in the food. It can come from your environment, like advertising in your environment or any Mm -hmm. kind of stress. Mm -hmm. Like if you have stressful television going on in your household, you'll get cravings from that. It can be relationships. And a really big one that people don't recognize always is loneliness and emotions. People do recognize emotions, but loneliness by itself is so stressful that it can cause cravings. So in our programs, we just work through each of those six categories. Loneliness is pure at the moment you walk through the door. I mean, not not physical door, but the moment you register for one of our programs, you get this huge release in uh, in cravings just from curing the loneliness. Mm -hmm. And then you just learn, okay, I need to set a boundary in this relationship. I need to drive a different way on the way home. So I'm not cued by pictures of fast food or billboards Uh, on and on and on and on. It's a, it's a lot of deep skill building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. But it's something we can, we can do and it's it's little steps. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. There's hope. Yeah. Um, and Oh gosh, yes, there's hope. (laughs) Yeah. There's a lot of hope. We've, We've had our online recovery community for three years. We've tweaked it. We've improved it. We've strengthened it. And now there's, uh, I would say we have a pretty reliable method. Okay. And Joan, how common is an addict, you know, how common are um, processed food addictions? Is it, is it like, I, I mean, from everything you've said, it sounds like it, it's everyone, everyone in you know, in, in, a, in a developed world. Right, right. It's, this is worldwide. Two billion mm-hmm. people around the world are overweight or obese. It spread very quickly because the tobacco industry, when it started to get in trouble and lose market in the U.S., it was able to lean on the State Department, the U.S. State Department, to open markets in other countries. And they, so the tobacco industry was went around the world very quickly. It had the relationships with the corner stores Mm -hmm. around the world, and it had the advertising relationships. So when it got a hold of processed foods, it was able to just, you know, just push it through those distribution channels. And uh, advertising contracts become less expensive the higher the volume Mm -hmm. of advertising. So they put the processed food advertising on top of their existing tobacco contracts and so they got very very cheap advertising for these processed foods and that's why obesity spread around the world so fast Hmm. 20 years and now diet related diseases are the leading cause of preventable death in the world 
in the world. So this is a global problem. But when you think about how does somebody become obese or overweight, they don't want to be. Right. So you know they have unintended use. They don't want to eat that stuff. They don't, they're just, their brains are screaming, don't eat that. But don't eat that is in the frontal lobe. And the addicted brain cells compete with the frontal lobe and win. It's such a deep addiction because it starts so young and so mm -hmm. many different substances and it's reinforced all the time. Mm -hmm. You know they all have failure to cut back. And they all have cravings. And they all have a use in spite of knowledge of consequences. And uh, they're very likely eating for reasons other than hunger. And they're spending a lot of time at it. So that's over 70% of the U.S. population likely has a severe addiction. But I think the story that really illustrates this is I had a prepared meal company at one time because it was the wrong model okay. before I really appreciated what it means to have a severe addiction. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I'll just give people clean food and then they'll eat it and they'll feel so much better and then they'll just want to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, no. <laughs> so that's like saying to an alcoholic, look at this great water. Mm -hmm. You know, drink water, drink water, drink a lot of water and you'll feel so much better and you'll just want to drink water. No, you have to recondition. You have to retrain billions of brain cells. That's just, it's just ridiculous. But anyway, we were serving a high-end law firm. And I would call those lawyers at the end of their first week, and they would be, like, puzzled. Be like, so I'm thinking more clearly, and uh, I'm not having that mid-afternoon crash. Mm -hmm. I'm not craving. Does that have to do with your food plan? So that was shocking. Mm -hmm. These are the highest performing people in the world, practically. This was a high-end law firm. So they get the cream of the crop from the law schools. And these people were affected. These people came out of an addictive, addicted state in their first five days of our meal service. Hmm. Wow. So it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's unless somebody's eating this way, I've never ever gotten somebody on this food plate. Like every one of our meal clients felt better mm -hmm. after the first week. Okay. All right. Um So I mean the cool thing is that I mean the exciting thing about that is mm -hmm. that everybody should try this. Right, right, right. And, yeah, see, and if you and feel can't the get through it, you know, mm -hmm. if you can't get through it, it's an acute phase of withdrawal, four days. If you can't get through that, you know, there are programs where you can go now and get the support to to actually conquer this. Right. And, and I mean, this is off topic, but I know we've been to um, some lovely, you know, we've had lovely spa vacations where you're having, you know, everything's fresh and prepared for you. And um, that can be a nice way to uh, get away from processed foods because right. you're, you don't have the triggers there. And you are comforted and supported and everything is, um, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. But not everyone can do that. And it can no, well, and the you problem know what? with that but, is but, that because this is an addiction which develops at home. Mm -hmm. And it's Place true. triggers are right. very, very strong. Okay. okay. So you come back to your home yes. and your, your brain says, oh, we right. know what to do here. <laughs> I don't know what was going on in that other place, but okay. we know what to do in this place. Sure. You're right. Bend. You're right. Yes. You're right. You're yes. right. So you just you immediately relapse. People spend $50,000 to go to a five-week residential program, come home, and within two or three days, they're binging again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, yep. So, Okay, so that uh, leads me to the, the next question, Joan. Mm -hmm. What is the best advice for overcoming a processed food addiction? If there is, okay. you know, without reading the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a complicated answer that I can boil down to two words. Conformance drive. Okay. Probably not what you were thinking. No. Here. No. Conformance drive engagement, what the heck does that mean? So for all the years of human evolution, the people who were able to conform to their band of people, their seven to 12 people, their tribe, their clan, those people lived. The conformers lived. They ate, they looked for food, they got under shelter, their children were protected, they fought off predators, 
in a group. They did what the group was doing, kind of like no matter what. The ones that wandered off, uh, they got eaten by the giant hyenas and they didn't procreate and their genes did not get passed on. So conformance drive, we have now learned, will overcome the addiction. Oh. So conformance drive is the overriding kind of factor in the brain, the overriding system. It's stronger than any other system. But what the food industry has done through the advertising and the availability, and now everybody around us is addicted, they've harnessed our conformance drive to the addiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can imagine if you were trying to give up smoking, but everybody around you was smoking. Mm -hmm. Or if you were trying to give up cocaine, uh, but you all your friends were cocaine users and you still hung out with them. That's why they have AA. They want to get that drinker away from the people, their drinking mm -hmm. buddies, mm -hmm. and into sober buddies. Uh, conformance drive is, in my opinion, the only thing that can overcome an addiction. That makes a lot of sense. And, and, it, so also, and it also makes sense on why the addiction is there in the per first place. Because like you're oh, saying, yes. they use that tool to their advantage and we're all stuck. Well, we're not stuck, but we're there. We're, we're stuck momentarily. We've gotten to where we're at. Right. We've yes. got to get out of that. And, well, here's, and, here's the incredibly good news is that only the frontal lobe, this little tiny, the frontal lobe is tiny, tiny part of the brain, 2%. It's just this very thin layer of intelligent brain cells are plastered on the front of the other 98% of the brain, which is still operating pretty much the way it was operating a million years ago. Mm -hmm. So you get, at, so the frontal lobe understands screens, the other 98% of the brain does not. So the other 98% of the brain thinks, Lita, that you and I are just sitting straight across from each other. Well, why is that so important? because the conformist drive is only engaged by people that the brain believes are in its own tribe. Okay. So I, you know, my brain thinks, wow, you know, I've been talking to Lita for an hour and hour or whatever, and she must be right here. You know, I should really pay attention to her and see what she's doing and start copying her because she's obviously in our tribe. Right. Got it. Got it. So screens work for engaging that conformance drive. Okay. And okay. that is a huge breakthrough. Okay. Yeah. So so there are tools that maybe people like yourself, uh, hopefully our show, will help other people to uh, find strength together and push forward and succeed, hopefully. Exactly. Um, see, this is early in the day, so I can still think. <laughs> How have your fr family and friends reacted to your career choice just just personal question now well you know um i i went to stanford business school as we've talked about i i have a really wonderful group of business school classmates who've been encouraging me for 25 years i've been in this field now for 25 years okay they're real excited for me um they they have really remained loyal other people have just jumped in and helped me incredibly over the years. And I have to say, honestly, that I know how dangerous it is for me to watch somebody eat processed foods because it'll trigger the, those addicted brain cells are going to be addicted the rest of my life. Like, you know how to ride a bike, you know how to ride a bike for the rest of your life. Those brain cells are holding on to that information, you know, waiting for you to rent a bike on vacation and that there they are, you know, ready to go. The addicted brain cells are the same way. So, um, you know, my immediate family uh, eats pretty darn clean. Okay. And I have to say that I don't have, I don't have friends who, I mean, who just would invite me to go out for ice cream or something like that. And they know better. Okay. Well, and that's they good. They're not attractive. <laughs> I mean, they want to have be friends with people who are going to go with them joyfully to eat the the right, whatever. Right. Yeah. Well, that's true. Really I guess that's true with that's, all your activities. Right. Are that's true with smokers or drinkers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They don't want somebody around who's right. reminding them that they shouldn't be eating that. 
Right, right. Yeah, that, my that, friends are in my recovery community. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's a really good question. Now, that, having said that, let me say this. When we get members into our community, we train them how to stay in relationship with their families and their friends. Okay. Um, how to make their the processed food use of those people minimal in their minds and make all the other great things about the relationship bigger. This is Al-Anon. So this is, this is incredibly great training that comes out of the uh, people who are in relationship with an alcoholic. You make the alcoholism in that person as small as possible and you really focus on making other aspects of the relationship fun and interesting. Okay. You know, they're sick. They okay. didn't ask to be sick. Okay. And so stand by them, help them. Don't let them abuse you, of course. Don't buy into their rationales. Don't let them criticize you. But it's a complicated thing, but we also, that's a skill set. How do you stay in relationship with these people that you love, knowing that they're eating these uh, really destructive substances? Right, mm -hmm. right, right. Got it. Um, hold on. Who's Who's up? Jean. Oh, um, sorry. Uh, what are the advantages? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, well, I'm just curious. What are the advantages for eliminating or reducing? I mean, you have mentioned several. Um, but if you reduce your consumption of processed foods, what are the advantages of that? I know you said the law firm was a great illustration mm -hmm. where they saw, you know, uh, results within a week. And I have another question to add to that, if I may. How quick do you see the advantages show up? Good. These, are, these are really, really good questions. So uh, an author, Nancy Appleton, maintains a website where she's got studies linking processed foods to a disease, and she's got 141 diseases now. So if people ask me all the time, well, do you think my identity will go away? Mm -hmm. And I said, probably, mm -hmm. but oh. let's find out for sure. Okay. So how fast do these diseases go? So what are we talking about? The ones that everybody knows are diet related, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, high blood pressure. Everybody knows those are diet related. So diabetes can start improving after the first meal. So what you're doing is you're regulating glucose release through the foods and the combinations on your plate. I have a really good story about this. I was demoing our prepared meals out in a corporation one day. And this guy came out, got a free meal for lunch, and he came back a couple of hours later and he looked like in a state of complete shock. He said, I have been fighting a losing battle with diabetes for 20 years. And uh, I have a pump implanted and I follow my diabetes educators advice strictly. And I am getting sicker and sicker. He has to check his blood glucose every hour. He said, my blood glucose has been steady all afternoon. So what the heck is going on with these meals? Mm -hmm. So when, when you're when you're stabilizing glucose because you're, you're, you don't have any carbohydrate that's going to get into the blood system too fast, well, you've got stable blood glucose. So he got on the meal plan and his after a couple of weeks, his doctor begged him to stop exercising. He said, I don't know how to keep up with reducing your medications. Wow. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Shock. Yeah. So this is this is a message I hope reaches every diabetic. Mm -hmm. The type 2 diabetes can be put into remission. Type 1 diabetes can be stabilized to the amount of insulin that you're using is vastly reduced. The control is much, much better. Okay, so you've got the obvious ones. The not so obvious ones are cognitive impairment. Mm -hmm. That is uh, attention deficit, learning difficulties, poor decision-making, poor impulse control, and memory loss. Yeah, thank because you. Let's hit that. <laughs> is the blood flow to the addicted brain cells. It's depriving the frontal lobe of blood flow. Oh. So oh. that is something that people notice within four days. I'm thinking more clearly. Wow. All of these foods are inflammatory. So they inflame the brain. I think that's probably the basis for the release from brain fog. Yeah. So uh, you've got all the, the mental, you know, the intellectual impairments get better. 
And that can take some time, depending on how much the person has been using for how long. But we have a couple of people coming out of attention deficit right now. They just gradually over a year or so have noticed that they're, they're thinking in a linear kind of way. The emotional, the depression, irritability, anxiety, and shame issues, they also get better. So these uh, addictions kind of wear out the feel-good pathways in the, in the brain. Those reward pathways are the feel-good pathways, mm-hmm. they're the pleasure pathways. And under this bombardment, constant bombardment, the receptors for those neurotransmitters collapse. And you can see it on a brain scan, clear as day. They come back. Those receptors will open again. You back off the bombardment and they will open up again. So we see vast improvement in depression, irritability, anxiety, and shame issues, chemically based. Share chemical. Processed foods, like all drugs, elevate adrenaline levels. That's why my raging got so much better. Okay. It's because my adrenaline levels went back to normal. I wasn't afraid and I wasn't angry, chemically driven. So there's a whole whole range of emotional disorders that just kind of fade away over time. Plus you're in a community. So all the stress from loneliness is, um, is reduced. Mm-hmm. Irritable bowel syndrome, infertility, heart disease, uh, all the respiratory, sleep disorders, uh, they're all, they all get better because they're, they're basically four systematic problems that processed foods cause. One is inflammation, two is hormone disruption, three is digestion disruption, and then four are the, the changes in brain function. And they all, it's just amazing. It's the most beautiful thing because everybody's hardwiring, everybody's factory settings are still there. Mm -hmm. And when you take off this burden and you put them, you surround them with caring people and they start to think caring things about themselves, they're copying caring behavior. Can I just say this? And I hope this doesn't sound over the top, but in 25 years of doing this, the only thing that does not get better is if is for something that's been surgically removed. Oh, we cannot grow back a thyroid. Right, right, right. We cannot right, right. grow back a, a you know a bariatric surgery stomach. But everything else, I can't grow back a gallbladder. Everything else just gets back to normal. It's amazing, and it's so it makes it so much fun. I mean, I remember thinking 25 years ago when I just got off of Sugars and Flowers, it's what I said. It felt like winning the lottery every day. I couldn't wait to get to my support group on on just one meeting a week. Now we have 12 hours a day. Out of every 24 hours, we provide 12 hours of live programming. There's a live trained expert person either on the screen or on the phone. Wow. It's because that really speeds up the conformance drive engagement. Okay. People will swing over and they'll start conforming to the arc, uh, it, sometimes within three or four days. Okay. Yeah. That's great. It's fun. It's so, it's so fun. Right, right. People have been told, you know, my back pain is, is for a lifetime. I just have to manage it. And then it goes away because it was actually due to swelling. Oh, this is not going to get better. It's because of an accident. And then the pain goes away because yes, there's something out of line there, but it only hurts because it's swollen. It's so much fun. That's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I know you were mentioning it's it's uh, similar to Al-Anon. How could I support someone? Let's say that I don't have a food ad- uh, processed food addiction, which I do. <laughs> I but let's say. <laughs> let's say. <laughs> okay. Let's say I don't. Sure. How could I support someone that does have one? This is a brilliant question. Uh, and I don't get this question often enough, so thank you for asking it. You control the queuing in the ho- inside the household. Okay. You make clean food, and you fill the air with the smell of that clean food. You fill up that crock pot with 
ground turkey and black beans and tomatoes and onions and peppers. You put in that chili powder and you cook that for 12 hours. It's not, you make a wonderful delicious. beef stew or yes. chicken stew. Okay. And you just let that cook for 12 hours. You fill that house. So because for you know, all the millions of years of human ev- evolution, if food was available, you ate it. Mm-hmm. If, you, if food was available, your food seeking brain would make sure that that was the food you wanted. So availability is a huge part. And you never have to say anything. You, know, you right. can offer it. Right. You've got this great turkey chili here. And maybe they'll go straight past you and go out the door and go get the fast food. It might take a couple of years. But so food availability and food smell. The, the sense of smell is the only part of the brain that is exposed to air. So that particulate, you know, the little microscopic particle of smell in the air lands directly on a neuron. Eyes, ears, everything else has a, 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 a nerve that it has to travel before it reaches the brain. Smells touch the brain directly. So smells in the house are very, very powerful. Uh, media programming, stress, like just if that person insists on watching stressful TV and all TV is stressful, stress activates the addiction, the stress pathway and the addiction pathway are just lie very close together. So when you twing the stress, it dings the addiction and off you go. So uh, just like, you know what, darling, I'm not going to watch stressful TV with you anymore. I love you to pieces, but I'm going to be right over here at this table working a puzzle. I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be doing the laundry or whatever. Mm-hmm. I just, I'm just not going to watch stressful TV with you anymore. Well, everybody else in your household has mirror neurons too, and you are closest to them. So after a while, their mirror neurons are going, uh oh, our tribe's not watching TV. They're working a puzzle. Oh, we should probably go over and work that puzzle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or else the hyenas will get us. You know, right, it's, right, right. It's primitive thinking. Right. So uh, that's another big thing. And then not eating processed foods with them. Sure. Okay. Sure. And a big one is to finally persuade them to, if they're going to, if they need to keep processed foods in the house, to keep them in the trunk of their car. Oh. Locked. Okay. So that you create a little bit of a barrier for them. And you can say this, you know, like, I don't want to be triggered by Mm -hmm. having it available. Um, so if you want to have it available, you've got to lock it up in the trunk of your car. Okay. They're not seeing it. Seeing things is a huge trigger. So you would help people by not allowing it in your house. Uh, if they, if it is going to have to be in your house, cause they're adults, they live there. They got to lock it in the trunk of their car. Uh, so you, you know that remember one of the five A's is availability. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Working on avail- you can work the availability angle a lot. Okay. Get, um, you know, get the cookbooks put out of sight because cookbooks are big triggers. Get any kind of magazine out of sight. And, you know, just stop those subscriptions to those, those food porn publications. Okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, be, become aware of the advertising. If you have small children, don't let those uh, processed food toys in the house. Those, those are diabolical triggers for small children is go through and get anything that's got a logo on it out of the house. And then um, if it's children, if it's small children, they don't get a choice. Okay. The idea, this is, this is the most diabolical, sick thing. You've got an addicted child. Mm -hmm. So the addicted brain cells are controlling behavior. And then the food industry comes along and says, they should have a choice. They don't have a choice. The choice brain cells are being deprived of blood flow. The child doesn't have a choice. So as parents, we protect our children from all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. We need to protect them from the food industry. Well, and that leads me to my question. How can parents encourage their children to eat less processed foods? It's a pretty cool thing. So you never fight with children. Okay. You, know, but you don't want to fight with them because you don't want to give them, you know, a, an eating disorder. Mm-hmm. But here's the cool, 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 cool thing. You're only feeding them clean food at home. Like, it, you know, I have this really. 
facetious thing I was saying around the spring holidays, which is, well, sugar is worse and more destructive than cocaine. So don't give your children sugar until you've run out of cocaine. Oh, boy. <laughs> Just like trying to get it through. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so yeah. yeah, don't give it to them. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I can remember where I was standing practically where I thought, okay, I'm giving my children substances that make them irritable with me. I think I'll stop doing that. <laughs> it just, the, the light bulbs come on gradually. Mm-hmm. You have to give this a lot of time right. and a lot of light. Right. I'm right. not ready to think about that right now. Maybe in a couple of months, I'll be able to think about that. a lot of time, a lot of patience. We have all the time in the world. Slow and steady wins the race. Uh, parents do different things. So it's just like let things run out. They'll, they'll just let things run out and then and it won't replace them. My children were thrilled because this witch, this really raging, <laughs> critical, mean person left and a nice person came in her place. Mm-hmm. So when I sat down with her, I said, I'm not going to keep these things in the house anymore. They're like, mom, anything we can do to help you? Why don't you want us to get out of the house? We'll do it right now. <laughs> like, so they saw the, the results and okay. they were highly motivated. Okay. And then their results were incredible. Mm-hmm. Wow. So um, don't talk about it incessantly. Your, your children are going to go through withdrawal, which is absolutely heartbreaking. They will be throwing themselves on the kitchen floor. They will be screaming how much they hate you. But just, you know, register. I'm sorry you're going through this. It's withdrawal. And I, I'm just, I'm really sorry. But no, we're not going to go to a fast food outlet and get you a fast food meal. There's good food right here. They might not eat for four days. They're not going to die. Uh, you just got to wait it out. They're, they're, so if something else happens with drug addiction. It also competes with natural food seeking. So children who, uh, you know, the parents say they're a picky eater. They only eat Kraft mac and cheese or something. That's a deeply addicted child. And you need to get all the reminders of Kraft mac and cheese out of the house, anything else that they could just shift the addiction to and start putting out clean food. And you get a new child. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the coolest thing. Like my children were BC students. They would start to try to study and then they would end up fighting with each other and going to their rooms and it was a disaster. And after we got them off these drugs, they just sat and did their homework. Their grades went up. I didn't, you know, I had a lot of fun with them, but uh, you you get these highly successful, easy to manage, very interesting, nice energy, not interested in TV kind of children. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reward is you just, just get these really fun children. They're not having meltdowns. They're not screaming at you. They're not fighting with each other. I mean, the fighting in our house, so I quit fighting with my husband. He quit fighting with me. Uh, we, we stopped fighting with the kids, and the kids stopped fighting with each other. Yeah, it just became a completely different household. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah, that's great. That yeah. is success. Mm-hmm. So do we go on to the uh, tips, hints, and tricks lightning round segment of the show? Like a game show? <laughs> yeah. All right. Sort of, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ten-question lightning round, Joan. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay, just going to be quick answers, right? Uh huh. All right. What is in your go bag? Do you know what a go bag is? I should have described this. It is. It's an apple and sliced turkey. Thank you. Oh, great. Pepper, pepper turkey. Oh, pepper pepper turkey. turkey. Okay. Great answer. Great answer. Uh, what makes traveling easier when you're trying to avoid processed foods? Cooking all your food the night before and packing it in the bag, in the refrigerator. Meatballs. Meatballs are great travel food. Okay. Oh, that's right. a fun answer. Ten points. Ten yeah. points. Yeah. The food's fantastic. All right. What is your go-to snack meal, like in between meals? Uh, an apple and a sliced turkey or an apple and a, a drumstick or a cup of berries and some sliced beef. Yeah, something that I, I have made myself. Like I brought home the roast beef and I cooked it so I know what's in it. Okay. Two ounces of uh, protein 
or uh, plant proteins, like a half cup of quinoa and a low sugar fruit. Okay, that's, yeah, great. All right. Do you have tricks for swallowing medicine or for taking your pills on time? Just a general question. Yeah. You, you know, you're going to find your doctor taking you off those medications. Okay. Okay. There you well, go. there you yeah. go. That's a Great good answer. answer. <laughs> Best answer yet. <laughs> and if your doctor doesn't know how to de-prescribe, mm-hmm. uh, just ask around until you find one who does. And a lot of doctors don't. They know how to put you on, but they don't know how to get you off. Oh, geez. all right. Uh, what do you always bring with you when you go to the doctor? Um, my insurance card. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Sure. All right. Okay. Great answer. Well, I mean, I get these annual checkups. And right. Everything's right. fine. I'm 69 years old and everything's still fine. I have asthma from having smoked, but no. Okay. Yeah. Boring. No, but, that's good because yeah. you're, yeah, you're a living example. Right. What do you use as a distraction during treatment or testing? This is, I think, really important because people go through treatment and testing and it's so stressful that it triggers cravings. Mm -hmm. They leave the doctor's office and they go straight for the bakery. Yes. So meditation, it's, um, I use a light meditation, a light, light in a couple of different ways, but I imagine that light is coming out of my brain. Okay. It does release the calming uh, pleasure neurotransmitters, but in a really gentle way that's going to last for hours. Oh, so good. the light meditation. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. Good. And that's mm-hmm. it. It's so simple. You just imagine that light is coming out of your head. What mm-hmm. color light? Just like a warm yellow, glowy. Okay. Kind okay. Of okay. Light. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, what do you work? Oh no. How do you work through a pain flare? Same way. That light meditation is actually releasing opiates in the brain. And if you concentrate, like your finger is burnt, Mm -hmm. uh, if you concentrate on making light come out of your finger, those opiate neurotransmitters travel across the brain to the nerve endings for that finger. Oh, okay. It's your own natural Mm painkiller. And it works. It's worth practicing. Mm -hmm. The more you practice it, the more effective it becomes. Okay, great. Give us three of your favorite recreational pursuits. Okay. I love to walk. Mm-hmm. Walking, by the way, stops cravings. Okay. Love to play with my grandchildren. Aww. Me too. Yes, of course. And I love reading. I'm just, I'm here at my desk. I'm stacked up with reading all over the place. Okay. Okay. All right. What animal best reflects your personality? I don't know why, but I am a great blue heron. Oh, okay. Sure. Okay. Yes. <laughs> How do you, I don't know. <laughs> what do you do to treat yourself? I will read. I'll get into the bathtub before I go to bed and read for 15 minutes. Okay. Um, Wonderful. Great. Well, we definitely have a winner um, today, and we really appreciate <laughs> um, all of your all of the information that you've given us today. Um, I know Lita is going to be changing her, her lifestyle ra- rather uh, radically pretty soon mm-hmm. because of all of your advice. She could um, tell by the look on my face oh, that I'm, and, I'm and absorbing the, it all. The copious notes. Yes. Um, but Joan, how can our listeners learn more about you and your oh, program? Thank you. I, w- I would recommend the first thing your listeners do is go to Food Addiction Reset and take the self quiz. Okay. Okay. We'll have okay. a link for that on, um, on our website too. Yeah. All right. And, and I did have another question. Oh, you, okay. you mentioned, hold on, I got to go back to my notes that Jean said were copious. Yes. Okay. Yes, they are. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, Nancy has uh, a website that lists 141 diseases. What What is that oh, website? No, website. Uh, uh, one, of my peop- one of my employees told me about it because uh, I asked her to go and look and she said, yeah, it's 141. But if you you can, you know, we have a free Facebook group, okay. food addiction education. And with now we have a centralized where all of our services are in one website. And that website is processed food addiction.com. Okay. So, uh, and we, and I do a lot of free stuff. I mean, I, I had the grace, my father had just died. So I had enough inherited money to sit for three years and write this textbook. Well, that was nice. And uh, that's my that's my gift back to the mm-hmm. universe. 
you go on processfoodaddiction.com and the very first segment has uh, links to a bunch of free stuff. Great, great. Thank We've you got very a much. Channel. We've got a page, a, a free page of handouts. We have a lot of free stuff. Great. So, Wonderful. I will be using I, that myself. I, but I don't want to <laughs> delude people. You need to be in a community. Mm-hmm. Okay. You got to you got to get that conformance stripe switched over and then keep it switched over. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So yep. that's, you can start that community uh, uh, research at foodaddictionreset.com. Okay. Thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for joining our yes, show. This was absolutely oh a pleasure. Guys, this was really a great interview. Thank oh, you. Thank, thank you. you. Great questions and your hearts are so in the right place. And I appreciate you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Yeah, we, we've definitely learned a lot from this episode. And we're going to be taking it to heart for sure. And, yes, thank yeah. you. and thank you for taking the time out of your day. We really appreciate oh, it. Oh, I'm, I'm delighted. Oh, thank you. If our listeners have any questions or comments related to today's show, they can contact us at podcastdx at yahoo.com, through our website, podcastdx.com, on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And if you have a moment to spare, please give us a review wherever you get your podcast. As always, please keep in mind that this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, and always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment, and before undertaking a healthcare regime, and never disregard professional medical adv- advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this podcast. Till next week. Hello.